Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight for this final extension session that forms part of Renew's Sustainable House Day program for 2024. My name is Nathan Scalaro, and tonight I'm pleased to be hosting this panel on enoughness, building small and clever, which will shine a light on embracing living in smaller ways and how living small does not take away from your experience, but adds to it. We have people tuned in from all over the country this evening from a wide variety of stolen and unceded lands. I'm speaking from the traditional land of the Wurundjeri, Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nations in Melbourne's north. And I acknowledge that the traditional owners have nurtured this country for over 60,000 years through their spiritual, material and economic connections to the land, air and waterways. I pay my respects to elders past and present and extend this respect to all First Nations people the world over. So here at Renew, we're very grateful for the support of our sponsors, and in particular, those who make Sustainable House Day and this series possible. On this uh, last night, we'd like to thank the New South Wales Architects Registration Board, Bank Australia, Witchcliffe Eco Village, the ACT Government Suburban Land Agency, Lighthouse Architecture and Science, Envirotecture, and Cargo Cycles as well as our local council partners, Marybeck, Marybeck and Banyol City Councils, Winds Caribbean Shire Council, and the city's Yarra and Coburn Councils. So tonight, as I said, we're going to tackle how to live small and clever, drawing on the expertise of our wonderful panelists to dig into the fundamentals of enoughness, how our possibly preconceived ideas about how much we need could benefit from a new lens. What actually do we need to live healthily and happily in our homes? And how might living smaller be a positive not only for your hip pocket, but for the well-being of the planet and all who inhabit it? For those who uh, I haven't met before, haven't seen me before, I'm the managing editor of Renew Magazine, and I work with a range of social and environmental organisations, amplifying their positive impact through journalism and storytelling. I'm joined tonight by three awesome people who are all experts in their fields, and they're all going to be approaching this topic from different perspectives. First up, I'd like to welcome Matt Delroy Carr. Matt is a registered architect in Western Australia and the founder of MDC Architects. His home that he designed and built has been featured in both Sanctuary Magazine and this year's Sustainable House Day. He established his firm with a focus on the residential sector, particularly on providing solutions for the missing middle of home ownership. Over time, his interest involved to exploring the economic dynamics of home ownership and the reason behind the strong preference for volume built homes in Western Australia. Matt's fundamental belief is that architecture should be for everyone and is central to an improved quality of life. Matt is joining us for the first time here as a panelist and we're thrilled to have you on board. Thanks for being here, Matt. We'd also like to welcome Jane Hilliard. Jane is a wonderful returning guest of ours, whose knowledge and ethos, ethos for designing and living in small sustainable spaces is one that needs to be shared with larger audiences. It's actually from Jane's company, Homeful by Designful in Hobart, that the word for this evening's session title, Enoughness, was actually borrowed. Her practice specializes in environmentally sound small designs. Homeful's approach to energy efficiency and sustainability is to embrace enoughness. They believe that a small home allows a full life and using less is one of the most powerful ways we can lessen our impact on the environment. Jane is featured in Sanctuary Magazine issues 64 and 67, quite possibly 56. She's all over the pages. She's awesome. Thanks so much for joining us again, Jane. And um, last but not least, by no means um, least, is uh, Dr. Martin Frenny. Marty is a building designer and building special scientist with a PhD in the life cycle, eco impacts and thermal performance of housing. He runs Earthship Eco Homes, a company dedicated to the design of sustainable homes and to education. Marty is the creator of Australia's first council approved Earthship, Earthship Iron Bank a multi-purpose building that transforms from an off-grid design studio into a weekend bed and breakfast where people can experience an off-grid eco home. It's 
So great to have you with us as well, Marty. Thank you all. All right, so I'm going to have some questions to ask the three. We're going to have a conversation um, up until 7.30. And then during our dis uh, discussion, I'll be putting viewers' questions also to a panel, which we'll focus on in the last half hour. And you can put your questions into Zoom's Q&A window at the bottom of your screen as we go, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Please be mindful that questions that are really specific or detailed may not be appropriate for a panel event seven. Okay, so let's get started. What, what is enough? Jane, I'm gonna start with you. So you led with this term enoughness. Um, how, how has that come to define your, your practice and your design approach? Mm, oh, okay. Um, well, I started out my career working in other architecture firms and I guess my experience was, uh, yeah, really insightful. Um, I basically kind of thought, oh, I reckon we can, I think we can do this a different way um, because I was seeing clients and people uh, coming to build a dream home, mm -hmm. um, but the whole process was had a lot of tension. Everyone was quite stressed. Um, and a lot of them were not ever getting built. And I think that's such a waste of time and money and energy by a lot of people. Um, so I thought, well, the easiest way to, to try and manage this is to reset expectations from the very outset before you even started talking about how many rooms are in a home or what you want. It's about... Um, well, what's enough for you? And, and, and enough is different for everyone. And then if enough, if everyone thinks about what's enough for them, that then had a knock-on effect to keep the budget more in check. Um, and also following on from that again was that it had a knock-on effect to a uh, positive impact on everyone around them, local communities and the planet as a as a whole. Because if we all think what, well, what's enough for us and use a bit less that is better for everyone and the whole planet so it came from initially how can I help individuals and in, individual clients to manage their tension between their brief and budget and actually getting something done and then well this is good for everyone and the whole planet so I think yeah let's let's mm. I just go with that <laughs> mm -hmm. and so do you think that um when people are asked that actually asking themselves that question what is enough it automatically makes them think differently about how they might approach designing or renovating their home automatically that's there or do you need to kind of encourage them along and get them to um, see what is possible it totally depends where people are on their own kind of journey with everything but I do find that it just shifts people out of the thinking about what I want and what is my home going to look like or what's going to be in my home into personal, more values-based. So starting a project from a place of values, what are your personal values, is great for a lot of things because it kind of focuses in on the um, meaningful stuff that unnecessary things drop away and it helps people think a little bit broader beyond them, beyond yourself and what you want. It's thinking about, well, what is my contribution to everything? Um, mm. it, I just find it shifts people's way of thinking to begin with and then everything can stem from there. If we come back to well, what's enough, um, it's not saying having less. That's the thing. It's different language. If, if you think I'm having something taken away from me or I have to have less, that's really negative. But mm. what's enough? Sometimes it's more of something. Sometimes mm. it's more, for example, garden or connection to outside or connection to other people. It can be more, but it's trying to take that negative, really hard things that we as humans find it really hard to let go of things to more, I guess, philosophical and val um, values-based, which a lot of people are looking for now, really looking for a meaning and value in everything that they do yeah mm, mm, awesome well let's um we'll continue to unpack that um throughout the rest of the conversation we'll hear from matt as well matt so you mentioned the other day in our chat that your practice began with a big build that you did for your parents and then in the last five to seven years your trajectory has, has changed in, changed in your practice can you tell us a bit about what that process has looked like and and how you come to be where you're at now yeah sure um i think the the most interesting aspect for me when starting out, we, we have a 
young architecture practice in the standard architecture um, was that we, A, we wanted to do a lot really quickly, wanted to have a lot of impact, sort of sink our teeth in and, and get a lot of experience in different areas. And, and the first project we took to site, as you mentioned, was a relatively large one, relatively large budget um, and somewhat complex. And it was kind of approached on a very naive basis from my end, for better or worse. That's kind of not not part of it. But what it taught me, and I, I actually had a fair, fair bit of involvement on site with the builder jumping jumping ship and um, not being the architect and putting a hard hat on instead. And what it, I, I guess it started to inform the way I thought about buildings and what we wanted, what I wanted to get out of doing architecture. Um, and how much impact we can have on buildings through the lens of affordability in the sense of how we detail them and the decisions we make and how much easier it is actually to make good decisions that don't have major cost implications from the building perspective. I suppose once you're standing on site, it's kind of easy to retrospectively look at things and go, well, that's that's a much simpler way of doing it and we're still gonna achieve the same outcome. So it was about taking all of our projects from there on and really critiquing what was necessary in, the detailing of them, what was necessary in the scale of them, the, the complexity of rooms, the relationship of volumes, doing less, I suppose, conceptual thinking and more pragmatic thinking. And I guess that ties totally into what Jane's been talking about. Enoughness is, you know, what what did we feel at that point in time was enough to to then start taking architecture forward as a practice? And it, and it was really about minimising complexity, minimising cost. And it subsequently led into a number of decisions which are i guess more um more commonly talked about carbon footprint um living smaller um, and thermal performance of a house or su uh, sustainability i guess is the umbrella term mm. but um it's we started to then critique okay well what's what are the materials we're going we're using the buildings why are we using them what are the impact each of these materials has both cost thermal um embodied energy and the constructability. So I guess it's sort of a process of elimination that was rather than getting more complex and more developed and evolved in mm. the sense of bigger and more resolved buildings, I guess it's more resolved in a much simpler sense. And that's what we really found a niche in WA, particularly offering those sort of services and, and I guess working on homes that aren't overly complex and do do enough and perform really well. and and um, offer a great living environments for families. Mm. So have there, has there been an element of you taking clients on this journey of getting them to see what what they need and what 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 is enough and yeah 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 I, it's, that's the you know age old question as a, any designer has to face is how do you actually communicate the the benefits of these things to people and and the reality is it's just being able to show people I think Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we've got fantastic software now that can communicate a lot of stuff, but mm -hmm. the, the realities of the experience can't be communicated through the computer. So, um, you know, there's a few years of development where we have people trusting enough to let us do these projects and then we're able to take people through. But I think that's, I guess, where you're probably leading to is where we've been able to take the discussion is that undertook the you know risk of building our own house and we wanted to kind of embody all of those principles, all of those learnings, and all of the things we wanted to then continue learning and develop as a, you know, I guess, what the practice as a whole values and try and apply them to our own house and not necessarily doing it from a, this is the best outcome point of view, but trying to test a number of things and then really self-critique ourselves and be able to tell people, well, we did that because of this and that's a great benefit, but it also has this impact, which you need to consider. Mm. Spatially, you can actually take people through a small, I say small as a relative term, and take people through a small dwelling and show how smallness doesn't necessarily mean compromise um, and it's really about the things that are important to people I say us but pe people in general you know connection to garden light sunlight ventilation good air and healthy healthy living and I think everyone can relate to the benefits you have from that whether it's big small micro yeah. tent you know there's yeah 100 percent we'll, we'll take a look at that house 
um, a little bit later as well. So it'd be good to use that as, as a case study. Um, Marty, I'll throw over to you now. You bring a slightly different perspective to this conversation, potentially. I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe not. But <laughs> obviously, you um, you come from the Earthships background, mm. and I want to ask a bit about how your expertise in Earthships and building with waste materials contribute to a theory of enoughness. And also, just before you get to that, it'd be great for those people who don't know um, much about an Earthship. What's kind of the elevator pitch? How do you describe what one is? Thanks, Nathan. Yeah, the uh, quick description of the earthship is that it's um it's a building made out of natural and recycled materials as much as possible and the real iconic material is the car tire which we fill with earth which of course is uh, a super sustainable material so you know rammed earth and mud brick are sort of um using that same um, ethos of building with the earth and uh the advantage of a car tire is that they're readily available and we don't need to worry too much about the particulars of the earth like you would for round earth or mud brick. You need very um, specific types of soil and gravel, et cetera. Uh, and the other part of Earthships is um, uh, trying to be really self-sufficient and resilient. Uh, and, and so they tend to be off-grid homes, but um, there, there are now a few in Australia uh, in the in the suburbs. And so, of course, that that leads to very low or no utility bills because the the building is uh, doing everything for itself in terms of harvesting its own um, electricity and water, and even treating its own wastewater. So the um, the garden that you can see next to me here every time um, someone uses the shower or washes their hands, the gray water flows through that garden and um, irrigates the, the bananas that are growing back there. So it sort of introduces, it sort of brings the outside into the building and really gets people to connect with nature and um, kind of start making um, more sensible choices about, um, of course, I'm not going to spray pesticides around in here because you know I'm, I'm living in this building i'm not going to pour terrible things down the drain that's going to kill the plants in the garden so it just sort of helps raise um these awareness levels of um sort of other other aspects of life um and of course being off grid you got to start paying attention to um the the weather and you know sun and rain um because um and, and this, I think, is where it taps into this idea of enoughness. Is that um, is that uh, there's not a never-ending supply of power and water. Like we sort of have that illusion in our modern industrialized world, and it only seems to be limited by your ability to pay the utility bills. You know, that's that's when your power and water ends. Is when you can't pay the bills. But the actual reality is that there's a limited supply of this stuff. And we, we, we don't usually hit that limit until there's a drought or there's a power outage or, you know, some some problem with the energy grid. Um, but, yeah, in, a, in an off-grid home, of course, you're sort of up against that every day sort of, and it forces you to be more conscious of your energy and water consumption. So, yeah, that's, that's what I really love about Earthships and other off-grid homes. Um, how, you know, I guess the other thing I didn't mention is just the the real focus on energy efficiency and water efficiency, um, which is, of course, um, you know, a really important thing that most most architects are looking at today is energy efficiency. Mm -hmm. um, but it's already been mentioned this evening that um, just trying to reduce the embodied energy of the construction stage and also try and prevent issues at the end of life stage of the building when it's deconstructed or, um, or you know, scraped into the landfill. How do we ensure that the materials we're building with aren't, you know, some terrible thing like asbestos that's going to um, cause big issues one day down the track? Yeah, fantastic. Uh, already we're starting to hear there are so many different ways we can think about enoughness and, you know, how that applies to the design and the building of a home. Um, so I'm going to open this out to, to everyone now. And Marty, maybe we'll start with you just because you've been speaking. And um, so there was an article that reported 
and hopefully we're able to share this Guardian article. Um, I'm not sure if we've got it on hand, but if someone has it, then it'd be great to share that with everyone. Um, that reported that Australia has some of the biggest houses on earth and the largest average new houses. So in 1960, Australia, the average house size uh, in Australia was 100 square metres, and now it's more than 230 square metres. So we're in a housing context where volume builders are really driving the story of, of what it means to live and how we live. And so the, the question I want to invite you all to think about is, is how we actually re-educate. Um, and um, is this something that needs to be advocated for, a change in building regulations, local council laws, just some thoughts on, on where we're at uh, as a country. Marty, do you want to kick us off? Uh, yeah, well, um, I think one thing to keep in mind, the averages are always a bit misleading. Um, you know, 230, that means there are some that are a lot bigger than 230. So sure. that's also yeah. good to keep in mind. Um, and yeah, this, the slide you see there shows just some slightly different numbers, 214 square metres for Australian homes. And um, the smallest one there is Hong Kong at 45. Um the United Kingdom is 76 square meters. So it really goes to show just how um, sort of affluent and perhaps to use a, a more um, provocative word, how greedy we're being um, with uh, our resource consumption. Um, and, and yeah, so this idea of what's our, what's our fair share of resources um, to build our, you know, our homes, um, I think it's a really uh, interesting, thought-provoking question. You know, just how much does each of us um, kind of want to capture? Um, you know, for ourselves, for mm -hmm. our own selfish motives. And of course, we all need a roof over our head. But how big does that roof really need to be? Is kind of what we're discussing tonight. Mm -hmm. And so, I, I guess my thoughts on how do we, you know, maybe drive things uh, in the in the right direction would be. Um, I think the, the building codes at the moment uh, make it a little bit difficult for um, people who want to build tiny houses. So um, to give just a couple of quick examples, if you um, jump online and look at tiny house designs, you'll, you'll often find they've got a little loft space where the bed is um, and under that might be the bathroom. And um, generally, they're not really um, to code because the code mandates some minimal minimum ceiling heights that just aren't being met in in um, particularly those sleeping loft spaces. Uh, and then also things like the stairs to get up into those loft spaces and not to code. Um, so I think, uh, but you know, like they seem to be very functional buildings, often very beautifully designed, uh, and. Uh, I think it's a pity that these things um, like, and so the way people get around this is that they they build tiny houses on wheels and by putting them on wheels, they're now not permanent buildings and therefore they don't have to comply with the code. But if you were to sort of build it as a as a standalone um, sort of non portable, not on wheels building, then you'd of course having to be complying with code. So um, uh, yeah, I kind of feel like maybe we need a whole new class of buildings in the National mm. Construction Code. Um, there's all there's about ten different categories for everything from yeah a, a home to a hospital, and uh, I reckon we need another one for tiny homes, and that would really really help to legitimise the whole thing. And um, yeah, and maybe maybe yeah, I think a lot of people are building on wheels when they maybe didn't mm. really want to build on wheels. You know, they mm. just really want mm. to have a tiny home mm. and that of course building on wheels adds a whole lot of extra cost mm. um the mobility of course can be really really helpful for certain types of people um maybe you know if you um haven't really settled down and you're kind of on the move um looking for work or i don't know looking for a holiday you can take your tiny house with you but yeah that's not for everyone and i think the idea of building a, a really small um space efficient home could could um really take off if we had a new class of tiny homes in the National Construction Code. Great one. Thanks, Marty. Um, please, Jane, I'm going to... Oh, did sorry. you want to say something, Matt? No, yeah, no, get in there. Gonna, get I in was going to extend on Marty's, yeah, yeah, Marty's comments do. there because, I mean, we've, yeah. I'm on the other side of the country, so mm. kind of a, many similar contexts but some differences. But I guess we've, we've very conveniently just gone through a massive overhaul of our planning system, um, that, you know, residential planning codes, 
below apartments, so you know, anything from group dwellings and single dwellings. Um, and whilst it has been watered down somewhat, it has offered a lot more opportunity for small homes, ancillary dwellings, you know, 70 square metre footprint dwellings to be able to be built on essentially any site. So, you know, deleting minimum site requirements for ancillaries, having provisions for small dwellings, having provisions for buildings to be built on micro lots less than 100 square metres. And I mean, whilst I think the, the beast of construction and home ownership over here is really driven by volume, volume builders and finance models and, and our land availability, we just have too much land that keeps getting put up for subdivision. Unfortunately, that's not, not stopping. I think there are a lot of good things happening over here where there's a lot more opportunity now to be able to look at an alternative model of living within inner ring suburbs that have high value. And I think that's the other key thing is that when you're talking affordability, I think the general population needs is considering affordability when they're building a house or buying land. And the default here is, well, we live further and further out because it's becoming more affordable. So how do we kind of bring that back into the inner ring suburbs that have high amenity, that have good transport infrastructure, I mean, not compared to Sydney and Melbourne per se, but um, I, it, I, you know, it comes down to financing and value and how do we look at housing in those areas that aren't apartments, but they're not standalone houses. And I think there's a lot more opportunity now to do that. And as Marty pointed out, as long as they're consistent with the, there's often a sort of disparity between planning codes and then building codes, as long as they can kind of tie those two together, there's a, there is good opportunity. And there's a lot more um, interest we're mm. finding in our mm. architecture practice, finding in different living models. Mm, great. Um, yeah, it's really good yeah, information there. I want to try kind of just reframe this, a little, well, not reframe, but take this in a different direction around how we actually ed re-educate about what it, how much space we need. And I, I was going to ask you, Jane, you know, I, I know you have a rule of thumb of what um, of how much space is, is, is enough for a person. Maybe if you can start with there and yeah, yeah give us a bit more. Sure. Um, so we use a... A um, bit of a rule of thumb where if we're designing a house for more than one person, um, we go with 30 square metres per person. So we find that for a family of four, we're looking at a 120 square metre home, which we know that we can fit everything that uh, that family needs in that everyone's got a, a space for themselves and there's sufficient space for the heart of the home where we're kind of trying to focus things on anyway. Um so we use that over and over again, and it works over and over again. Um, we find that at the end, when things are built, that the homes are comfortable and they feel, you know, with you know good design and thinking about it, they feel you know generous. Um, so you can definitely go smaller than that, um, and we have. Um, but I um, done this for families of three to seven. And yeah, it um, seems mm. to work for us. Yeah. Mm. When you're talking through a, a brief with clients, can you tell us a bit about what you're asking them to consider and what that process looks sure. like? Well, as I said, touched on before, we always start with values. Values, yeah. What are your life values? Because I think when people think about their home, we immediately jump to what it looks like and what's in it. Um, but I think when we really think about it, we're actually not wanting the dream home. I do not like that term whatsoever. I like, we're we thinking about the lifestyle really, how are we going to feel and our home, what it looks like, how big it is, is not giving us that, our lifestyle, what we're doing in our life, who we're spending our time with, um, how much sunshine we're getting, how we're interacting with everyone around us and our environment is, is what the dream is really, I think. So start with values and that's slightly different for everyone. There's some real common threads. Um, and that just sets the framework or vibe of how we're going to go into a project once we've got values sorted. Now, that can be quite full on for some people. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. Oh, we're going to design a house. I just need to tell you what? how many rooms I want and what sort of yeah. tiles I want. Yeah. It's like, no, I want to know, like, you know, your values, personal values. Um, really enjoyable for some people, quite challenging for others. Mm but it's always a great process. And then we go, well, what are the functions in your life that are going to meet those values? So then we go to functions and they might be things like um, spending time in the garden, 
having friends and family over for dinner. And those functions that we identify are the meaningful things in their life. And that's where we're going to focus the brief on. So we're going to make sure we create spaces to facilitate those functions. Um, obviously, there's just the, the you know, toilets and showering and all of that. But um, to be honest, I'm just not that interested in how many bathrooms or what tiles people want. Um, we know what functions are, then we can um, design spaces around supporting them. Mm. So that's where we start. Mm. And I, I love the process. I like working mm. with people through it. And I think people, I've had people go, I um, actually just uh, last week um, had a message to say, whilst I was very challenged by Jane, I really enjoyed the process. Mm. So it can really have knock-on effects to people's whole lives not just their home, which I think is really powerful for spreading the whole, you know, message, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So I'd love to talk a little bit, of, a bit about some of the cleverness of design for small buildings, um, the multifunctioning of different rooms, for, an, for example. Matt, maybe a good place to start is to start showing us the house that you built and that was open for Sustainable House Day and you can talk us through it and some of the things you did there. I did. I might actually wasn't open for Sustainable House Day. Oh, I wasn't. Um, Sorry. Uh, but I do, yeah, it, it was up on the website. We, we did a very similar gotcha. project that was open. Yeah. Um, do you have the... Blends? Someone does. I'm sure it'll appear at some stage if you want to start talking right. about yeah, it. Sure. Yeah, sure. So yeah. our house, and um, this is by no means a small house. So I guess what we were trying to do with this was a design house for your typical 300 square metre, and I'm talking Perth context, so typical 300 square metre, that lacks or otherwise subdivided block in, a, in an inner ring suburb. And I think it was critical for us that we wanted to be in a, in a suburb that had really high amenity. Um, conveniently, we're in a suburb that actually had shares a lot of community values around tree canopy, community itself and engaging with people um, and, you know, rejecting the idea of lock up garages, don't talk to your neighbours, um, detach yourselves from everything around you kind of approach. So it, it, that all kind of worked within our philosophy anyway. But the idea with the house is I've, I've got two, a wife and two young kids, two, mm. two boys. Mm. Um, we had to offer enough amenity and this is enough for us, but also enough for the sort of clients we get because we always have these questions around, well, should it be bigger? Do we need more? We're not sure. And there's always the uncertainty before you hit go and you dig ground that maybe we need to make it a bit bigger or maybe we need to change that. So I wanted to stick to everything that we know and do well and that's just efficient floor planning that offers enough for a variety of occupants, whether, you know, this, this house would suit a couple, it would suit, uh, you know, a single parent and kids, it would suit a rental for four people or three people. Um, but it's also a little bit adaptable in its future thinking as well. So it's 140 square metres of total floor area. Um, but more importantly, from my point of view, that it's it's a... Um, offers 70% open space on the site and 60% green permeable surface treatment. And that was the kind of driving factor behind the project there. The relationship between the northern glazing, which is the sort of the centre line of the page there, and the front fence line, which is the laneway, um, was equidistant. So the, the, the depth of the house and the garden in front was at least equidistant, if not offering more to the, the garden space. And that meant you have a really nice connection between the primary living areas and the ground floor, which are subtly separated by, you know, brick staircase, different volume treatments internally. Um, but it also means that you get a really deep sunlight in winter. I mean, we're, we've got a, a climate, Perth and the vast majority of heavily occupied areas of Australia have a, a climate that's so well suited to open the house up through most of the year because we get breezes, we get really good access to sun. Um, it gets hot, so we need to deal with how to keep the house cool passively. So we worked really hard with the thermal mass in the house. And the other aspect was that it needed to feel like it was a much bigger home than it was. So um, whilst it's only modest in size, it doesn't feel at all tight anywhere in the house. Um, so the, the and, and then it just came down to sort of good good design planning principles. We do a lot of multi-residential development work, townhouse, townhouse developments particularly. So everything's about how much can you squeeze out of every square metre. So we wanted to apply that to this, this project on the basis of what was the orientation, where did the garden go and how usable was the garden space. Um, if you want to go to the upper floor, 
And the, I guess the key design decision internally, and we don't profess to do fancy architecture. It's, it is very much about planning principles, first and foremost. Um, inherently, we want it to look somewhat decent, but I think the looks of it are subjective. So that's kind of irrelevant in the big picture. But the key key principle here was that the, the central void of the house offered, it offered a lot. It offered um, a thermal chimney, first of all. So in summer, it's great for, for flushing out hot air. And not and because we've got a timber frame floor upstairs, we don't have that thermal mass to stabilise it. So it, it enables a lot of the heat upstairs to, to be flushed out through high level windows. But it also connects every single space in the room to the main living areas. So, I mean, acoustically, it can be loud sometimes, but uh, the visual connection you get and the spatial quality you get through the void in the middle is, is far more impactful than actual floor area itself. And that was a kind of key key consideration that we had to have a space that was generous but compact in its in its um I guess in its size and the floor area. We didn't want to have two bathrooms that had two toilets and then another toilet downstairs. So the, I guess this touches on Jane's Jane's issues with toilets, but <laughs> keeping keeping one toilet out that's shared and making the bathrooms as compact as possible, using materials in the bathroom that didn't require constant upkeep there. Um, we used a you know a, a surface treatment that's that's you know, net zero in in construction, and then bedrooms are only big, as big as they need to be for kids. This isn't you know intended to be a house for six adults to live in or anything. It's it's mm -hmm. about a couple and two kids, so everything was just as big as it needed to be and nothing more. And mm -hmm. I guess the the only critique I've got of myself is that the living area is actually bigger than. I thought it would be, and it it feels more generous. It's almost like we can shave it down a little bit, but I think that's the aspect of it that makes it more than just a compact home and mm -hmm. makes it quite a viable solution for a lot of people. And you mentioned the uh, the other day that we spoke that you um, you start with, with the garden and that dictates a lot of, of how you approach the design. Do you want to speak to that a little? Yeah, I think garden, garden and orientation are two things that are, I mean, this is from our definitely from our experience working with the new medium density planning codes over here that um, the garden and the orientation of the house are two things that are very much ill-considered in building design or construction or anything. And it's such an easy thing to get right from the very first decision that sets up a whole lot of successful outcomes further on. Um, the prioritising the garden in the north you know, the northern aspect of the site means that you can then have a living area that faces north and is connected to a deep garden space. The garden space, depending on the site's context, you know, we tried to set minimum parameters like six metres on, on a site such as this, absolute minimum six metres of the depth of the garden at the narrowest point. Ideally, we sort of go six to eight metres and then you get a nice length. So I think mine here is about seven and a half and then it's got about 16 metres long. Um, once you've set the, the parameters for the garden, the house only has so much space left before you need to start dealing with planning codes like setbacks, uh, not creating little wind tunnels at the back of the house, but actually functional spaces. So the rear on the south of mine is the setbacks increase slightly so that we can actually have an array of fruit trees at the back and it's still productive. So that you're kind of left with a house footprint that as architects or, any, or you know, building designers, we know we can make work. We know that if we can fit things into spaces that don't appear like they should be able to fit. So that's not really the hardest point. The hardest point is getting the garden right, getting the orientation right, and then the building will result. The building then benefits from the thermal connection, you know, the thermal benefits. You've got great ventilation through the narrow north-south aspect. You get great thermal heating in winter because you have really good access to sun. So my entire ground floor there, uh, where the dining table is, right to the back where there's a little window seat, that entire area is bathed in sun in the middle of winter. So at night time, the, the, you know, the floor slabs, hot, warm. It feels like I've got underfloor heating on. Mm. It means your building with less material as well. So apart from the cost benefits you're going you're gonna, to um, gain from it, you're reducing just by virtue of material, the, the, uh, reduced materials, you're actually limiting your embodied energy going into the house. Even if you are using high embodied energy materials that might have thermal benefits, you're still limiting the amount you're using. So it's a step in the right direction. It's not, you know, the the final goal that we need to get to, but it's it's sort of doing all the right things. Um and it's less to clean. <laughs> That's 
Cool. Now I can vacuum the entire house from one PowerPoint in one day. <laughs> yeah, awesome. It's a beautiful project and it's worth checking out. Now there's a link there to it on the Sustainable House Day we uh, website. Um, Marty, I wanted to ask you uh, about some clever design hacks for people who are wanting to reduce their house size. I wonder if there's something you can you can share with us from an Earthship perspective or any other perspective. Uh, yeah, okay. I'll have a crack at that. Yeah, uh, give it a go. I think one one idea would be to uh, think about how you might be able to start small and extend, you know, do that do that um, upsize reno later rather than do it at the beginning. Cause I mm. think what a lot of usually young Australian couples um, maybe not yet with children um, sort of fall into the trap of buying a McMansion, spending a lot of, you know, money and big mortgage. And of course, with I mean the the other problem of course with massive homes is they cost a lot to heat and cool, so you end up with not only a massive mortgage but big utility bills. So if you could sort of flip that all around and go, could we start with something really small? Uh, maybe it's it's just you know one bedroom to start with, but you could easily add on more later. Um, I, I know there's there's all sorts of that that really increases the degree of difficulty for the designer um but uh yeah i don't i don't think that's um out of the question mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh so um yeah i'll i'll throw that out there as an idea start small yeah. and anticipate right. that idea of extending later if and when you need it maybe maybe you decide you don't need it um and you can you can live live small awesome your whole life uh, I'll open that up to you, Jane and Matt, as well, and and add to it um, another question around how tips for how we can actually live in our homes more effectively. So a two-parter, clever design hacks or tips for living more effectively in our homes. Um, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> I think what I notice is that we double up on things. Uh, so thinking about spaces in homes multifunctional and grouping functions together so that we're just having one or something like bathrooms. I know I tend to talk about bathrooms a lot and toilets, um, but they're a really intensive room of a house. They cost a lot. Um, I've got high embodied energy, um, you know, and if we design a house well and get the grouping of functions and flow right for the particular group of people living in it, we can refine that down to I think for your I guess typical Australian family home to one um, but something that I do like to do is do what I call a deconstructed bathroom so we've still got one of everything but the functions are in separate spaces so they can all be used at the same time mm -hmm. so what I mean by that is we have a separate toilet a separate vanity space where people can brush their teeth, do hair and things like that, and then a wet room. So in the mornings, which, you know, families are busy, someone can be having a shower, someone can be in the toilet and another person can be brushing their teeth all at the mm -hmm. same time. We've got one bathroom. Mm -hmm. um, so just thinking about things like that. Um, I was just going to give everyone a little tip. The, the thing before that Martin mentioned about lofts. So you will ne you need to speak to building surveyors about this, but something that we've done before is... Um, design in it called it a built-in bunk bed so um i know that people love lofts but you do need to be careful around them but i'm just speak to you building today but just try a built-in bunk bed um and i like also functional circulation and or if there's hallways um make them functional or put um things in them so uh things like a laundry could go in there um, a study space but I think we have to be careful with study spaces in homes they're important these days a lot of people are working from home they don't work if they're tucked under a staircase no one ever uses them because they're grim and you need to think about I'm going to spend time here and they need some natural light they you need something to look out the window to you need to be close to a heat source um, so but I think your, our hallways can work harder for us um, or our circulation spaces. What was the second part of the question? Um, uh, tips for living well in our houses. Um, 
I think is about the whole idea of enoughness and how we think about our homes now is that the design itself is not going to solve all our problems. Mm -hmm. We talk about energy efficiency. Mm -hmm. Um, The star rating that you get for your house is not a tick box on being sustainable. One of the most powerful ways we can reduce our comfort footprint is how we're living in them so different we can you can have the exact same house and different people living in them will use a vastly different amount of energy so a part of enoughness is of thinking readjusting our and i'm talking as a society as whole readjusting our expectations around comfort and convenience and immediate and, and things being immediate um we are just you know always striving for more comfort more convenience and I think it's actually to our detriment because we miss out on some of the great ceremonial parts of life which is um, creating warmth for ourselves. I I think we we expect our homes to be a constant temperature all year round without any input from us and I think that's a very privileged position to be in and it's disconnecting us from our natural world because we live in a, most people in Australia are living in a country that has seasons and different climates and having more contact and being more in touch with that is is just great for us generally. Mm. Yeah, that's really interesting to think about the mental health implications of yeah. seeking too much comfort. Having less stuff, mm. you know, mm. having a small home and just having less stuff is excellent for your mental health. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. I, think, I think the other aspect of it as well is just understanding the what our house is and what it does. Like it it serves a purpose beyond just being a footprint to house us in it. it it's got a skin to it. It's got an envelope. It's got um, functional spaces that need, they need to be um, used. They need to be kind of actively used by the occupants. And we were speaking yesterday about, you know, how do you open the window? When do you open the windows in a house to let the breeze? So if you're not doing a passive house, which is kind of another topic in itself, you know, in our climate, we've got a, we've got a sort of, seasonal change that suggests opening and closing our windows at the right times of day is actually going to do most of our heating and cooling for us and provide all the fresh air we need um which is in turn going to change the kind of context of the room so you know opening the windows at the right times to get a breeze so it means this little small space that's got access to good light it's going to become far more functional it can become you know in my my lounge room for example i've kind of got a temporary study space which is sort of a future second room study space but it's it's so well connected to greenery, breeze and sunlight in winter that it's, you know, it's fantastic as a kid's playroom. It's great as a nighttime lounge room because it's cosy. It's great as a work at home study space, albeit I need a more comfy chair. Mm. Um, but it's just about understanding how it works as well. So it's it's got a different kind of microclimate in its own context within the house as a whole and it, it operates differently to the living room like with the dining room I should say which is the main living room which is a thermal chimney so it, it uh, what you know any any kind of heat that it absorbs straight away goes up so it kind of changes its characteristic to the lounge room which sort of sits quite stable and the kitchen again the kitchen is kind of the active space so there's a lot of a lot of doors being opened around it there's a lot of breeze moving through it maybe less wanted times of the day from a thermal point of view so trying to examine and explore each of the different rooms and the way they operate in your immediate climate, and I'm talking about the climate of Fremantle, which is, you know, great breeze in summer, 99% of the time, hot, bloody hot, but if you get out of the sun, you lose about 12 degrees of sort of um, the temperature by sitting in the shade. And if you can understand that, then each of the rooms kind of responds in the same way and you can deal with them in the same way, closing doors to sort of close up a room for a short period of time, opening it to flush out the stale air, and then you've still got the cool thermal ambient temperature in it and it, you kind of find you can start to shrink the spaces and borrow usage of each of the spaces by understanding the way they operate at different times of the day which which probably helps critiquing whether that space is necessary or whether that space can be an iteration of space a just six hours later in the day mm. yeah Really interesting. Let's um let's talk a little bit about the savings with small builds. So I think we've kind of touched on a few of them already, but not just uh, in dollars, but all the other ways that we're actually saving. Um, which I'm you know I'm, I want to open up for you all to speak to. So Marty, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Uh, I guess uh, 
everyone listening tonight is probably familiar with the concept of embodied energy, but just real quick, it's it's the energy required to manufacture a material. Uh, so it's, it's the embodied carbon. So the energy is directly related to the carbon and the pollution, other environmental impacts like deforestation or pollution of waterways or what have you. So whenever you're um, thinking material choices, um, thinking about that embodied energy is, is a real um, interesting one. And it's an important one. And, and also, you know, this discussion tonight about enoughness, of course, every square meter of the building is um, requiring materials. Um, and so, um, of course, the bigger the house, the more um, the more environmental impacts are caused by um, all those materials that go into the house. And so that's that's why I'm really passionate about materials, <clears throat> natural and recycled materials. Like um, straw is a great example. So I love. I love straw bale homes because straw is essentially a um, a waste material from agriculture, from our food production systems. And I've already mentioned the car tires, which are a waste product from our transportation system. And so it comes back to this idea of um, what's my fair share of this world? And if I can build with natural and recycled materials, like if we can just grow um, our building materials, um, sustainably without you know deforestation and causing habitat destruction for our um beautiful australian native animals then then that's a great thing um so uh you know i think i think that's um sort of a, a powerful concept to keep in your mind um mm -hmm. and a, a massive incentive for everyone to yeah how can i shrink the size of my home so i don't need as many materials and if if uh, you know, if if we do want to build the world's biggest homes, um, then let's let's build them out of um, natural and recycled <laughs> materials that 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 heat and cool themselves. Like Matt's been saying, you know, open close the windows at the right time of day and right time of year, and you don't need um, air conditioners. Um, so yeah, hopefully right. that kicks kicks off the discussion there. Thanks, Marty. Oh, can I jump in quickly in front of Jane? Just I, um, I guess this uh, on the same stem of my own house, looking at the cost. Just reiterate the question for me, so I can answer it properly. <laughs> Nathan, would you mind? Uh, oh, it's a general question around the kinds of savings um, that you make with a small build, so not just the financial. Yeah. Although you can certainly speak to them, but all the other kinds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I guess the the yeah, there's the financial and the kind of the carbon cost, and then uh, the other aspect is the the qualitative cost of materials and not not from an aesthetic, I like the look of that point of view, but the qualitative aspect of how your house functions from an experiential point of view. Mm -hmm. And what we've tried to do with our house is um, kind of deconstruct what the things that we did that are sustainable um, in terms of the embodied energy, the operational energy, the, the footprint of the house from mm -hmm. a small housing point of view, the thermal performance of the house, and kind of at the head of it all, the livability of the house and all of those things are interrelated and they all impact the cost of the house from a financial point of view. Mm. And I think if you keep adding, whether it's adding good or adding bad in terms of, you know, high, high its size or high embodied energy or adding from a adding from a sustainable additions kind of point of view, there's there's still cost implications. And I think you need to really critique when you, and this goes back to as soon as you're starting your project in the brief. Critiquing the the financial cost, but what's the cost that what's the cost that you're willing to bear? Because there's going to be compromises somewhere in terms of the the end product and how you want to live in it, what you want it to look like, what you want it to feel like, what you want it to do for the environment or not do. If it's a high embodied energy house, we can't we can't get away from the fact that there's so many houses being built that have high embodied energy. But if we're going to do it for the with a really high performing thermal performing, you know, a really, a really high performing internal environment that requires absolutely no heating and cooling and it's really well used, it's not just dead space, then there's still an argument that that is, a, that is an okay thing to do. Um, obviously, I think Marty's bang on in terms of if we're going to build big, let's build with, with self-sustaining materials, things that we can grow and things that are, you know, can reproduce really quickly. I think that's absolutely fantastic. 
apart from the broader kind of housing point of view, we need to kind of start with a, an end, we need to start the discussion with an end goal for each of our builds and what is that end goal and how are we going to best achieve that end goal for the best outcome for this immediate project. And, and that kind of starts to narrow down the complexity of sustainability and all the other aspects that kind of feed into it by just doing one thing really well. And that inherently has a knock-on effect to cost, mm. financial or otherwise. That's yeah. Great. Thanks, Matt. Jane, did you have anything to add to that? It's um, covered quite a bit. Yeah, I think when people are thinking about their budget and how much their home costs, mm. I think we really have to think about what sort of life we want because um, I've just seen people completely max themselves out financially and then have a fairly miserable time mm. um, and even end, end up having to sell this house they've um, mm. created. Mm. And that's an extremely unfortunate position. So generally a smaller house will cost less if you're sensible about it which I think then equals a fuller life because you've got more freedom basically you're not financially as financially um shackled um which is a growing um, issue for so many people um I think one of the biggest yeah so one of the biggest for us per personally is the financial impact and just with the cost of living but there's massive uh, massive um, benefit for our environment. I mean, a small house that say just seven stars is just going to use less energy than a bigger house that's performing much higher. So yeah. we don't have to go to the nth degree with smaller houses. This is my personal opinion with our energy efficiency and get carried away with that because we're already doing, I think, one huge thing, which is using less material and just generally using less energy because it's smaller. So um, with the with the just with the planet um, benefits of small houses, there's a great book called Less Is More by Jason Hickel, mm. which um, goes into a lot of these kind of things. It's quite eye opening about if we continue to live, if we're thinking about Australia and the size of the houses we're living in, and just what we're consuming generally, we're using like I can't remember exactly, but four planets. Um, per person per year, which is highly, highly unsustainable. Um, and mm -hmm. there's other people on the other side of the world that are using less than one planet. Um, so I think mm -hmm. that's a big one for me. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Well, it's a very sobering stage. Yeah, I, I, I want to just pick up on, on what Jane just said about other people on the other side of the world. Mm. I think there's about a billion people on the planet out of the 8 billion who don't even have access to a toilet. Mm. So, yeah. um, you know, we're, we're very, very lucky here in Australia. And I love, I love um, this concept um, and all the thinking that um, Jane's put into, you know, the idea of like, how do you, how do you have um, get away with one bathroom? Um, I, I live in a, a 110 square metre home with two teenagers and um, it's been a challenge to um, live in um, my bathroom that hasn't been designed by Jane to be super functional. Mm -hmm. There is sort of this like, you know, someone will be in the shower and be like, can I come in to brush my teeth kind of thing? Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and and yeah, just the environmental impacts of of the bathroom itself, not to mention all the resources like the water and the wastewater that's generated by that. Um, so this idea of enoughness, like we've all become obsessed with, um, sort of having a hot, lovely hot shower every day, but there are billions of people on the planet who've probably never had a hot shower. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. like. I mean, you know, like where do you where do you draw the line here, and like how much is really enough? Um, yeah. You know, it's um, a it's yeah. a massive question, and it sort of can get quite sort of triggering for a lot of people who like really demand their hot shower every day. Um, but you know, like that's that's a resource that that's um, that you're pouring down the drain, and so again, but it's sort of like well, if you're catching the water off your roof and storing it in a rainwater tank. If you're using the energy from the sun to heat the water, is there actually a problem? And the answer is, well, no, the, the, the problem is diminished dramatically because it's all solar powered and you've caught the water on the roof and you're not draining, you know, the river or relying on a desal plant, you know. So it's happy days. And that's what this whole 
whole kind of game is about is how do we create houses that don't sort of need all these inputs from um, coal-fired power stations and that sort of thing. Yeah, just on the bathrooms, living with teenagers, because I'm in the same boat, um, having to wait a bit is great, good for us. It's good for um, conflict <laughs> resolution. Um, so our houses can really, I think, make us better people out in the world. Mm -hmm. So I just think, yes, what you're saying, Marty, we have completely lost sight of the line of what is enough in a country like Australia. So, you know, it's over in the horizon. We can't even see it. So, um, yeah, I just suggest if there's, I know there's probably heaps of people listening that are very already on board with all of this. The the book by Jason Hickel is excellent. Um, yeah, I just recommend you read it. <laughs> it goes <laughs> into all that stuff, Matty. <laughs> Thanks. So many uh, lifestyle reality checks there it's, it's to think about. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to move into some audience questions now. Um, so we've got one here from Amy. She says, I notice lots of small homes are still using traditional swinging internal doors rather than sliding internal doors. I assume sliding doors would be more space efficient and I'm wondering why they're not used more often. Are they more expensive, less soundproof? I keep wondering if there are downsides of I haven't thought of. Anyone can speak to that? Speak. Um, they are less soundproof and they uh, cause drafts, so they're not good for heat zoning. Um, I also find that they're just not that great. To Just your experience of using it isn't as great. Um, and it's actually quite nice to have a little bit of space. This is not a big amount of space that a swing door takes up. It's nice to have a little bit of space when you're entering a different space. Um, I think it's partly the experience of using them, but also the soundproofing and the heat zoning that they're just lacking. Are they also, is a is a regular door better for accessibility for people in wheelchairs or mobility impaired? I Yes, I would say so, yeah. Yeah, yeah you got to right. course, can be a bit tricky if you're in a wheelchair. Just due to the Not handles sure, and the clearances. Sure. What was that, Matt? Uh, once you kind of factor in handles and clearance signs for accessibility, then it's they start to become more impactful because you can't slide it right back into a pocket and conceal it. So, sure. it, yeah, cool. then you need more area in the walls of the door mm. then because you've got to push it further back to get the opening and then you've got yeah. no insulation in the, in the wall. Yeah. Right. Um, Vanessa asks, I built, um, I suppose, granny flat um, as an efficient place to live in a very cold climate, still having the old farm cottage, aka the freezer. Whilst the little house is warm and basically sufficient, it isn't quite enough. What's the best way of moving forward for more extension? Noting the little house is passive house, not that simple, um, another detached building. Oh, not that simple, another detached building, question mark. Do we get that? What's the best way of moving forward for more extension, noting the little house is passive house, so not that simple, possibly another detached building? Always tricky without seeing um, some drawings and mm -hmm. photos of the building and the site. But um, if I could just quickly share one idea I have, because, it, it I mean, it's a terrific question because we've been, I think, tonight really talking a lot about new builds. And so... You know, in Australia, we've got millions of, you know, poorly insulated, poorly designed, drafty um, buildings. I think the average star rating of our existing housing stock is about, you know, 1.5 stars or something for energy efficiency. It's absolutely appalling. So the idea of like, how do we retrofit these houses um, is, a, is a really good question yeah. because we can't just yeah. knock them all down and, mm. and build, you know, these fantastic new homes that we've been talking about tonight. So, um, I, I mean, I'm really passionate um, about this, these greenhouse spaces that I'm sitting in right now um, on the north side of a building. And I think, you know, with clever design, um, if the north side wasn't available, you could position them to the east and west ends and still get northern sun. And then the idea would be to then duct the warm air captured in here. This is like your solar heater. And then with some low wattage fans, duct it into the existing home. Um, and then also you can you could even capture, I mean, hopefully you could you could tap into um, uh, 
like a source of grey water or create a new source of grey water by doing like a laundry uh, space in here. Just have a washing machine down the end or a shower. I'd love to do a shower in the in the garden here. Um, and, uh, you know, um, just sort of create that extra. Um, basically, I'm saying create a, create a solar heater for your home that is also this multi-purpose space where you can hang out in it um, and uh, maybe, yeah, maybe laundry or extra um, uh, shower space or something of that nature. It could be a way to retrofit and improve the sustainability and energy efficiency of an existing home. Um, but I'm sure Matt and Jane will have some some great retrofit ideas as well. I'm actually curious to know, and sorry, this is we're going to go off on a tangent here, Marty, because I've, I'm really interested in the, the concept of the, the kind of the greenhouse facade almost. Yeah. You know, I've obviously got an extremely hot climate and perhaps this is my yeah. naivety, but what? how do you deal with the heat gain, the result of the heat gain? Can you kind of pull it apart to allow it to naturally ventilate a lot easier at those times? Yeah, yeah. So um, you can now see the skylight up there and um, that's that's where the hot air will exhaust. But yeah, like so what I've what I've sort of discovered and I'm a I'm a bit of a, a temperature monitoring nerd. Um, I've discovered that um, uh, on a really hot day, say it's 42 degrees outside, um, it'll be about 32 degrees where I'm sitting here. And that creates a sort of buffer space on the, the living spaces just over there, which is, that's all double glazed. So um, those living spaces are then sort of buffered from the 42 degrees. They're, they're only experiencing 32 degrees in here. And so, of course, in the middle of a hot summer's day, I'm not going to be wanting to sit in the greenhouse. I'm going to be in there um, with the doors closed. Um, so that that's how we sort of prevent an issue with um, summer overheating. It, it, it does get warm in here, but people understand that, well, this is not where you hang out in the middle of the day in the summer, but come yeah. nighttime it, with all the doors and windows open, it, it actually is a nice place to hang out on a summer's evening. So um, yeah, and and I mean, also this, this greenhouse is also sort of creating shade for the living space as well. So I kind of actually feel like this is more of an outdoor area um, although it's totally enclosed um, and technically it's an indoor area. But if you if you imagine it as an outdoor area, then you start to understand how you can use the space. Yeah, I like um, the notion of it as a thermal buffer. I think it's probably quite effective in a lot of applications here. Marty, could you also plant do some deciduous planting on the outside of your um, sun space for yeah. shading and summer gaining winter? Yeah, absolutely brilliant idea, Jane. Um, yeah, I've I've um I've extended the rafters out. They yeah, stick cool. out just over half a meter, and and it is my long term plan to um grow some um glory vines or something out there. And I I really enjoy that on my straw bale home where there's a like a four meter canopy of glory vines. Um, and the only downside to that is I got to go spend a day pruning them <laughs> because, yeah, um they um they grow and uh but you know that's that's the i think a, just a beautiful concept and i think you know when you're talking about values you know I, I think one of those one of those things um one of those values i have is like you know um that connection to nature and um really wanting plants to be part of my life and um yeah it's a it's a pain to have to spend a day um pruning vines but um it's really well worth the effort for the beautiful shade I get in the summer yeah. and then, you know, cutting them all back and letting that beautiful winter sunshine in. I think you're hundred percent right. Yeah. Let's have more plants doing mm. beneficial things in our building. I mean, I think nature does everything we really need. I mean, I was listening to a podcast re recently on biomimicry, which is great. Um, mm -hmm. And I think we can do a bit more of that in our homes because nature really is providing us with a lot of what we need as humans and I feel like in some of our modern houses we're really shutting it out and kind of almost living in an esky um and I find that quite sad because um yeah uh one of the ways that we can turn the trajectory around is to become more in touch with nature 
And there's a question. Can I just go to, I can see a question here, Nathan. Yeah, which yeah said, go for what you want to answer. Yeah, is the enoughness philosophy compatible with architectural beauty? And I think this, I think there is some tension, to be honest. Okay. I think um, it depends on, you know, what we're defining as architectural beauty, but architecture for the sake of it just looking good, I think, is rather indulgent. Mm -hmm. Um we're at a point in the world where um, there's more meaningful things to, I think, to um, put effort into. But simple things are often just beautiful because they are. Um, mm. I just think there's some tension personally. Um, mm. There's some amazing thing um, pieces of architecture that are not overly complex, that are not huge and they're not... Um, I guess taking more than that's their fair share. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a really, it's a very interesting whole topic. Mm, it's almost that's, a reframing of beauty for us, you know, elegance yeah. in simplicity. What, what yeah. is beauty? Mm -hmm. What's it meaning? What does it mean to us? Mm -hmm. And what's it, what's it doing? Yeah. Awesome. Hey, super quick one, Marty, because um, we've got a few questions here, but there is someone wanting to know where are the earthships, uh, sub, where are the suburban earthships located and are there restrictions to build an earthship in some states? Can you give us a quick answer to that one? Um, yeah, there's so there's a suburban earthship that I designed in the Narara Eco Village, which is near Gosford in New South Wales. And there's one... Um, uh, in South Australia, where I am, in a place called Goolwa. And, yeah, the one in Goolwa is on 900 square metre allotment and the one in near Gosford, I think, was about five or 600 square metre allotment. And there was some so, um, design challenges with that. Um, the Earthship has, like, a lot of earth piled around it, as again, as another buffer zone um, and leads to really good... Um, temperature control and energy efficiency and so on a suburban block that becomes the main challenge so it's sort of got some different strategies for how you incorporate that earth mound around the building and mm. um, still manage to do that on a suburban block right um this is a good one what is a good size master and kids bedroom to aim for maybe i'll throw this one to you matt um new designs seem to be getting bigger and bigger do you have any thoughts on, on that one? Um, yeah, this is always one of the first discussion mm. topics when we're formulating a brief with clients for some reason. It's, the, mm. it's always the one that's been very specifically denoted on the brief, you know, how big it needs to be. Um, I, I think it it's a personal thing, to be honest, and I don't think there is a right size for it. But for us, I find that, I mean, it needs to be, it needs to consider the bed and circulation. And I'm not, I, I don't mean it from a um, accessibility point of view, but I think when you look at base accessibility requirements, there's some nice comforts that you get from that and functionality that comes from it. Um, but it needs to accommodate movement down either side. And then it depends where you road, you know, how you deal with your clothes. So in our case, we've got just enough down either sides of the bed. So it's, it's functional. It provides enough of a buffer that it's a comfortable space to be in. Uh, and our road's actually on the end of the bed. So we've got a, I think it's an 800 to a metre distance between end of bed and road. So I think all in all, it's about a four by 3.3. And I tend to find that's a fairly comfortable room size. Including it, that's including a road as well. Right. Um, and kids, sorry, kids, kids bedrooms. Oh, kids, yeah. Depends on the beds. I actually undersized one of them. I didn't realize my wife was oh. going to buy the kids a double bed with an oversized base, so it didn't, didn't fit as intended. <laughs> but it 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 really depends on yeah. how much fun you want to have with the kids' beds and what you want the room to do, and that's that's totally open ended. Yeah. Can I can I just tell a funny story about that? Yeah, yeah, please. Um, my my kids, because I I was stupid enough to build a straw bale house with one bedroom, and right about that time, um. We started making babies, so um, yeah, we ended up um, having to subdivide the, um, the the quite large lounge room to create these two little bedrooms and a smaller lounge room. And so, um, you know, the kids grew up, and um, the little bedrooms are fine to start with. Um, and then one day, one of the teenagers says to me, 
Hey, Marty, um, did you know that our bedrooms are smaller than the international standard for prison cell? <laughs> and I was like, well, you're not locked in there and you don't have yeah, to shit in there. That's right. So it's all good. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I suppose, yeah, small bedrooms can mm. be um, a, a bit of a bummer. Um so uh yeah some good some good planning which i didn't do is a great idea <laughs> great um all right so jane i might throw this one it's actually specific to you around your rule mm -hmm. of thumb of 30 square meters per person how does yeah. that work when designing for accessible living and well it's different yeah because exactly i suppose so. yeah different needs yeah um yeah totally different um basically yeah it that's depends. Right. all of it depends yeah. really on what you what are the functions that have to happen in this house or this these spaces yeah totally. so that's the first exercise the first project is to work out what are the functions and then you can derive the space that's required yeah. Yeah. from that yeah great um stemming on from that one someone's asking about future proofing for old age yeah um so they've made a couple of comments here around sliding doors no good for bathrooms can't be closed uh what is the best way to airproof a normal door? Maybe just some, yeah, generally thinking about um, this in the context of, of ageing would be mm. interesting to hear oh. about. Yeah. Um, well, I think, I mean, I've done a number of small homes for people getting older and we call it downscaling, right? Um, there's less less house to manage, you know, Um which I think is a good thing. Um, ease of movement around the house I think is really important. Step, steps, um, multiple doors, gates or steps to go through to get outside is can be a real barrier for people enjoying life. Um, and a smaller, simpler home can be just easier to operate. Um, yeah, easier to operate, easier to clean. Um so I think, and there's a lot of older people that are on their own now, you know. Um, I think if you're in a position of you've got some land and you've already got an established home, the old ancillary dwelling is a underutilised thing in society that can provide a home for someone that might not have access to have their own. Mm. Um, and I was going to say, Matt, are you allowed to build a 70 square metre ancillary in Western Australia? We can only build 60, and I just think it needs to be bigger. Um, <laughs> they changed the, the calculations oh. from plot, plot ratio area to internal area. So great. I wish it was like that here. <laughs> um, but I think, yes, we, I've done a number of projects, small homes for older people, either a couple or that are on their own, and um, they're loving them just because it's easier to manage and you can get on with those other things you'd like to be doing in life. Hmm. Just on the, on the same, I mean... I don't want to tread any toes, but on the same train of thought about future proofing, whether it's for aging in place or just future proofing either for economic yeah. or financial reasons, or you know, predicting what your lifestyle is going to be like down the track. I think it's okay not to future proof it in the sense of don't try and plan for everything. I know that sounds a little bit sort of naff and probably not the right approach in the current housing climate. But if we try and factor in every scenario in our life over its lifespan or the potential next occupant's lifespan, we're inevitably going to end up with bigger houses because we keep adding things to make them work for everything. So I think it's really about looking at the immediate context of your life that you're building for and doing the best you can for you within a certain time frame. And I think that time frame needs to be really well thought out. Yeah. If you're, you know, if you're trying to downsize or you're an older, not an older family, but I guess a middle-aged family with kids who are about to leave home and downsize and downsizing or factoring in future proofing for aging in places is, is important then absolutely and i think just basic accessibility requirements silver standard living requirements where you have flush flush thresholds bathrooms that aren't too cramped to move around and you can factor in grab rails if you need to it's just just fundamental things that will work down the track that you can add in but if you yeah i, I just think doing too much at the get-go is going to result in more and more and more and more and it won't be a sustainable yep. approach or affordable for that matter. Yeah. Like I, I um the guest guest wing or guest room is one of those. And there's a big cost involved in that. It might be 
50, 100, 200 grand that it adds to your, depends if it's the whole wing or just a room. And I'm just like, that's a lot of Airbnbs. (laughs) And it's thinking, well, do you actually, how often do you have people to come and stay in your house? It's, this is different for everyone. Some people it's something that is a big part of their life. And then it's a function that's going to add value to their life. But for a lot of people, it's a, as you said, Matt, it's a just in case. And it sits empty or it just gets, it's the junk room. It's the storeroom. Mm-hmm. Um, and some people, they think they need to have one, but they actually just don't really like having other people staying with them. You don't have to have a guest room if you don't like that. Um, yeah, as I said. It's, it's great point. context and individual dependent. Yes. Mm-hmm. I think every, the point I project. make is I think one of the things about building smaller or embracing enoughness is that people feel like sometimes they need permission. Mm-hmm. Whereas it, the normal is to build these huge Australian houses and that's what's done here. But you don't have to. Um, mm-hmm. There's a whole, it's excellent because there's a whole movement towards doing doing this in the, mm-hmm. in the industry and just mm-hmm. generally. So mm-hmm. I don't know. I'm like, everyone's got permission to not have yeah, a guest that's great. if you don't want one. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> awesome. Um, all right. Maybe one or two more questions. Marguerite's asking, is it more sustainable to retrofit a fibro house or knock down and rebuild? Can I make a comment mm-hmm. quickly on that? Sure. And this, again, it's along the lines of very um, context dependent and also about what you're trying to do with the project. I think you really need to look at a renovation from the, yeah, I mean, yes, absolutely embodied energy in a building. If you knock it down, you're, starting again, there's a whole, whole new level of embodied energy going back into it. But if you're looking at it from a, well, what is this building going to do for me at the end? Is it going to perform thermally? Is it not going to perform thermally? Where am I putting my money into? And if the answer is, well, I'm spending all of my budget just to get this house livable in, in terms of habitable, upgraded from an aesthetic point of view or functional point of view, but I'm running air con 24 seven because it's horrible, it's dark, it's impacting my mental wellbeing. You know, I, I've got to add another 25% of my budget to make those windows bigger or connect to the sun in that direction. Mm. Then there's there's absolutely an argument to knock down a, a, a house and rebuild it. I think there is all, or there's always a solution for renovation to improve the livability of a house. And, and we most of our projects are renovations because I love doing them. And, you know, if there's always a good outcome you can come to. But there are scenarios when if your goal is to have a really high thermally performing house that's massively improved livability, and your budget's only so big because inevitably a renovation that has a lot of it added on is probably going to cost more when also bringing its thermal performance up, then then there's a there's justification for rebuilding. But mm-hmm. I say that very delicately as well yeah. because mm-hmm. we've got so much building stock in the country that yeah. needs to be repurposed. Yeah. Um, I think it really depends, but I have just recently done a feasibility study for a family where they've got a really badly performing home, really badly laid out, um, not connected to the yard and the amount of work required to get it to a point where, you know, it's working and it's just the basic things, connection to North North sun, connection to the garden, you know, using the space well. Um, the cost involved in that full renovation, you're basically kind of touching every part of the house. And the more parts of a house you're touching, mm. the more budget you're using up. You're spreading it much thinner. There was about 50 grand difference between that renovation and building a new home. So whilst I have a fundamental kind of feeling about knocking a house down, I think that's one thing we really need to do now for our future, which is thinking about what how we're building our new houses so we're not in this position in the future um, and thinking about the materials we're using. If it can't be kind of compostable, if the house can't be compostable, can it at least be recycled? What what materials can we use to recycle? be recycled? Because, you know, not everyone can or wants to have an earth house. Um So thinking about, well, what materials can I use that can actually be recycled, actually Mm. be recycled, not just it says it on the website because Mm. we know that it never gets recycled. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Great. All right. So um, that's all we have time for from audience questions, but I just want to ask each of you um, about one kind of number one takeaway for people um, leaving this conversation. It can be something that you already said that you want to underscore 
Um, just to reiterate or to share, yeah, just the number one takeaway from your perspective on this. Marty, I'm going to throw to you to kick us okay. off. Thanks. Well, I, I would like people to imagine that um, as well as your credit card, um, that's your, you know, this is what measures how much you can spend in the world. Imagine if you had a sort of like carbon and pollution card. And every time you purchase something, whether it's new building materials to build your sustainable retrofit or, I don't know, new TV, whatever it is, you've got a, you've got a carbon budget. And um, that actually would probably be the limiting thing that prevents you from, you know, purchasing more and more stuff. Like you wouldn't run out of money you would run out of um, your um, your social license to um, basically rape and pillage the planet. So um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like you know, think think about that. What is my mm. fair share? How much resources can I can I can I borrow? You know, um, because it like Jane said, we're living off four planets at the moment, and something. Dramatic has to change. Thanks, Marty. Matt? Matt, my Zoom just crashed on me, so I yeah, repeat the question. Uh, a key takeaway for people to leave from this conversation. Um, good question. I, I think at a very high level point of view, and I'm looking at this from the architecture and you know, design lens, Yeah, yeah. is really critique your own brief from a um i don't want to say sustainability again sustainable again so could try and figure out what your house is doing for the year beyond rooms you know that's the second part of it i think more importantly what are you trying to achieve with the house that you're looking to build or renovate whichever it may be and what's the primary end goal and it doesn't need to do everything whether it's you know thermal inputs use of materials, functional future proofing, whatever, but what's the kind of key goal that's going to make it a success for you? And I think you can kind of cut out a lot of crap <laughs> that happens yeah. in between mm -hmm. just by simplifying that first point of your brief. Brilliant. Thanks, Matt. Jane? Um oh it was really great what both Marty and Matt just said. Mm -hmm. But I think a small house just leads to a fuller life. For us individually and for the rest of the planet so and i think that's something we're all yearning for a, mm. a, a life with meaning and freedom for mm. everyone and if we think about that and um how that impacts everyone else in the world and the rest of the planet is really powerful yeah yeah actually one more and i know this applies to everyone mm. here but Where's the garden? That's the question you need to ask yourself before you even start. Yeah, have a garden. I, sh I should be a landscape architect. I, I care more about the garden, but you know, where is it going to go? Because that's that's going to drive everything. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, everyone. Um, that brings us up to the end of our session tonight. Huge thanks to each of our wonderful panelists, Matt, Jane, and Marty, and uh, thanks again to all our sponsors who have made these sessions possible. They've been awesome. Really great series uh, on the back of Sustainable House Day. Um, so as this is our last session of the series, I'd like to thank all of those uh, behind the scenes who have made Sustainable House Day possible, the invaluable homeowners who are what make um, the day tick, uh, the Renew branches, volunteers, our amazing learned community of panellists and hosts, and the entire Renew team, past and present, in particular, Cara Finlay, who has made this series the wonderful forum that it's become. Don't forget to join Renew or subscribe to one or both of our magazines to support our work and for a wealth of information um, on sustainable design and living. And you can follow the link in the chat to get on board. That's it from us tonight. Thank you, everyone, for, for being here. Uh, great conversation.